That's my church. Hey, how many of you are glad you come to Real Life Church? Say amen. amen. Yeah, me too. Uh, it's been my church since about 2006 in my kitchen in Batesville, Arkansas. My wife and I were sitting in there, and I don't know that, I, I won't say what we were doing was complaining, but we were definitely just going, Lord, what you, there's got to be more to this. I had pastored for about eight years, and and was in uh, established churches. I had done youth ministry. I was a worship leader for a short time. Um, I don't play an instrument, can't read music, and they hired me to be a worship leader, so I fooled them. Um, but then I was a pastor at a couple different churches in that window, and, and I was pastoring a church that was by all accounts, and if you were looking at it from the outside in, you'd go, man, church seems to be doing good. Jennifer and I moved there. They were running about 60, 65 people. Uh, we were there three years. We were running about 150 to 160 people. God just blessed us. Things grew there. We had all the stuff. We had the gym. We had the auditorium. We had, we just, it was going good, except in my heart. It just Except down in my, in my, uh, my dad used to call it my knower, down in my knower. And I kept fighting with this. And one night, the kids had gone to bed. And by this time, we'd only had, we only had three kids. Parker was born in Batesville, so our fourth was, was coming. or as, She was pregnant, I believe. And we were sitting there and was just kind of like, what do we... I said, I'm so tired of this. And she said, what? And I said, I'm tired of on Sunday, people come in. And I go, hey, how you doing? And they go, I'm fine. I'm fine. And you can see that they're almost on the verge of tears and that the world is falling apart. And some of them I even talked to on Friday and said, hey, how are you doing? And they spent two hours telling me how awful the world was. But the moment they walked into church, they went, I'm fine. It's okay. I'm good. And I told Jennifer, I said, I just wish... I just wish there was a place, like I wish there was a church where it didn't matter how broken you could walk in. And that you could be broken when you walked in. That, that you didn't have to have it that all. That I, could, that I could be the same person on Tuesday in the produce aisle of Walmart as I was on Sunday preaching a sermon. And, and I'll be honest with you, for eight years before we launched Real Life Church, I, I did the dance. I mean, I did what I thought I was supposed to do, like I was supposed to wear the suit and I was supposed to have three points in the power and I was supposed to, I was supposed to have moments where I shifted into my preacher voice and my register got lower and the words stretched just a little bit longer when I would pray, Our Father. <laughs> you see your reaction there? You know why? It's because now there's a place I don't have to do that. I just, I just get to tell you what the Lord is telling me. And I'm thankful that you walk in with your brokenness. And so we wrestle with it. And so we, we sat there and we kicked it off, man. We were like, we got it. I said, I don't know what it is. I just want a place where people can just be real and authentic and just, just real life people. And she said, real life church. And I'm like, yes, real life church. And we didn't, we didn't look at the internet. We probably should have because there are about 6,000 real life churches in America. And we didn't check. We were just like flowing in it, man. And this was good stuff. And I said, that's right. We're, where real people can meet a real savior named Jesus Christ. That's, what, that's all I want to do. And God birthed this in 2006. We, we tried to launch in 2007. And uh, I showed up at uh, Flippin' City Hall when it was on Main Street. And I taught a Bible study from behind the judge's desk, which was the biggest pulpit I've ever seen in my life when you're a preacher. And seven people showed up. I want to clarify some things for you. When that happened, there were, um, there were six people in my family. It gets better because the second week... Only four people showed up. <laughs> and to clarify again, there were six people in my family at this time. And so we, we just kind of stopped. I was like, maybe, maybe we just missed it. Maybe we just missed it. Maybe we just missed it. 
And so I went to another church and I said, I'll be your interim pastor. They're like, do you want to be our pastor, pastor? And I'm like, no, I'm just going to preach. That's all I'm going to do. Because I, I feel like God's calling me to do something. I just don't know if I'm not ready or he's not ready or what. So I, I'm just going to take a breather. And, and so in November of 2008, we started having services at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in Flippin'. And we have never stopped. We have never quit. We have core values here at Real Life Church, and those core values, they're pretty basic. There's only about four of them. I'm praying that by the end of this series, that's my church, you know them, not because they are going to help you through anything, but I want you to know who we are. I want you to understand when people go, well, tell me what it is about Real Life Church. You got some stuff to say, okay? And, and I want you, these, these are not inspirational quotes. These are just things that we lean on when we start to get tired, when we start to not know what to do, when we start to need direction, and we go, what, what, what's our play from here? What's the next thing we do from here? And I go back to these core values. And the first core value we're going to talk about it today is we are never finished. Look at your neighbor and say, we're never finished. I mean, the sermon will be finished in just a little while, I promise, okay? I'm not setting you up to preach until after lunch, I promise, but... Uh, but this idea of never being finished really sat in my heart because there have been times in my life where I've thought, you know what, I, I, need, I, need, to, I need to not give up on something. Because it's, how many of you know it's really easy to give up? How many of you had a New Year's resolution? And you're not admitting it if you did. You're like, no, 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 Pat, it's April, Vince. Were you serious? We ain't still doing that. <laughs> we, we backed out of that dude about February, man. It's, Super Bowl showed up. They had those little weenies at the party, and I had to dive in. I couldn't, I couldn't hold on to the diet any longer. I get it. I, it's easy for us to quit. I, I mean, how many of you in here call yourselves Christians? Say amen. amen. How many of you have quit reading the Bible? Amen. Yeah. Some of you didn't even want to admit it. Thank you for those being honest. Can I just confess something to you since I told you that I wanted a place where I could be authentic? I've been a pastor for 20-plus years, and as a pastor, there have been seasons that I have not picked up my Bible other than to prepare a sermon out of it. I know, but you're our spiritual leader. <laughs> I know. And there have been moments where I just got it. Okay, I got to get, I got to get a sermon for Sunday. I got to put something together. And I wasn't in the word learning who Jesus was in me and who I was in him. I wasn't asking God to change me and develop me and grow me and cultivate the things in my heart. I was going, I need to give him three points in the power this Sunday and then let him go. Maybe I can make them laugh a little bit. Maybe I can make them cry a little bit. And then, and then we'll all go to Colton's. That was the only restaurant close in Melbourne where I started. So. But there have been seasons in my life like that where I quit. Quit praying for people. Quit. Just, I just stopped. And it wasn't intentional. It wasn't as if I just woke up one morning and went, I'm not doing this anymore. The, the Casting Crowns several years back came, up, came out with a song called A Slow Fade. And how many of you understand what I mean by that? Where it's not just like you wake up and go, man, I think that I'm going to just stop all things Christian today. It just happens. And, and here you are, you turn around and you look. It happens when you're in church. Some of you maybe come, starting to come back to church from Easter. And the reality is you didn't do anything wrong. You just got stuck in that reality where you, you go to church and then you miss one or two Sundays. And then by the third Sunday, you're like, man, if I go back now, they're going to be like, where you been? And I don't really have a good answer. Like, uh, watching the game. That's not good. That's not going to work. Um, I think I would, you know, fishing? No, that's not good. And so we, the enemy convinces us that, when the, man, if you tell them that, they're going to just think that you just back slacked off. And the reality is we just quit. And as a church, we didn't want to be a church that quit. We didn't want to be a church that just got comfortable. Uh, two weeks ago at Easter, we had 2,600 plus people in our Easter service. Last week, we had over 1,300 in a weekday service here at Real Life Church. Now, hold on. I want, before you clap at that, I want you to understand by all accounts, we should probably just sit back and go, whoo, whoo, that's a good run. Let's <sighs> take a breather. But let me ask you something. How many of you right now have a family member that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? How many of you have a coworker that does not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? How many of you have students in your school that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior? We cannot quit. We can't be finished. People are like, well, Pastor Vince, I get it, but I'm saved. I got saved, and then I stepped in that water and got baptized, and, and so I'm good. You just started. 
You're not finished. Well, yeah, but I mean, I'm making it to heaven. If, if you thought, I, listen, let me just try to clarify this for you. You are saved, and if you are saved, then yes, heaven is the destination. The Bible also says that you are saved unto good works. In other words, you are saved to do things until you get to heaven. He said, but, but, I, I mean, as long as I make it to heaven. Here, let me just, that Jesus is a pretty logical dude when you read the Bible. If he didn't have anything for you to do, the moment you said yes at salvation, you should have been gone. Right? Like, just imagine that Sunday. We about to have some church. Some weeks, wives would be like, honey, you need to go forward. You need to go forward. You need to go forward. <laughs> I know you're saved. Just try again. See, it didn't work. You didn't. I didn't you didn't pray it right. I need you to go. Go to try to pick up your kids and the children's life. I need to pick up so-and-so. That they just, we sang Jesus loves me. They're gone. I guess they got it. Like they got it. Like they figured it out. He loves them. They're gone. Right? But the reason that doesn't happen is because as much as salvation is the destination, the purpose of your salvation is to bring one with you. To share this message, this gospel, this story of Jesus Christ, this redeeming story that takes us from death to life. That's, that's what we do in the meantime. I, I, I can't wait. Have, listen, if the Lord wants to take, I have prayed this, God, when it's my time to go, let it be on a Sunday morning at about 10 35. Because the reality is, I would love right now for God to take me out, just poof, on the stage, and one of you go, should one of us finish? <laughs> Some of you wouldn't know. You're so Baptist, you wouldn't know what to do unless somebody prayed and dismissed you. I know. Like, Pastor Vince is dead. Do we pray? What do we do? I pray he takes me that way, but guess what? He ain't taken me yet, and since he hasn't taken me yet, and by the looks of the room, he hasn't taken you yet, and since he hasn't taken me and he hasn't taken you, it must mean there's still something left for us to do. So we cannot be finished. We cannot settle and be satisfied. Oh, man, we got a big church. We got three services. Last week, I was this close to adding a fourth one because we couldn't fit. In this service last week, we had 533 chairs on the floor. Hold on, hold on. Don't clap. It's about to get tense. We had 511 people in those 533 chairs. Now, I'll give you the reality. Here's the numbers. Statistically, in churches, once a room gets to about 70 to 75%, people stop coming because they don't like each other as much as you guys do here on the front row. People like some elbow room, right? Everybody likes some elbow room. I don't know if you do the math, but 511 out of 533, it's just a smidge more than 70, 75%. I believe God has stuff for us to do. I believe we're not finished, and I believe he's showing that. And what I believe is now it's up to us, church, to prepare for the harvest that he's bringing. Say, so, yeah, how do we do that? We don't quit. We're never finished. I'm going to try to be a better pastor tomorrow than I am today. I'm going to try to be a better dad tomorrow than I am today, a better husband tomorrow than I am today. I'm, I'm, I'm not giving up. You say, but why is it so easy for us? I'm going to give you three reasons why we quit. I only got through two last service, so if I only give you two, I'll throw the last one out this week sometime online. But right now, here's what I want to dive into. You've read the scripture where it says this. I, oh, I haven't even read it yet, have I? Let me... Let's go ahead and read the Bible today, Okay. <laughs> Galatians chapter six, verse seven, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. God will not be mocked. For whatever one sows, that will also he reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from that flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. That's pretty simple biblical theology there. If you do your thing, the only thing you're gonna produce is your thing. It's going, to be, it's going to be corrupt. It's going to be broken. Why? Because we're broken. 
But if we do God's thing, if we sow God's thing in this world and and we do what he's asked us to do, then what we will reap out of that is God's blessing and God's benefit out of that. So it's a pretty simple structure. I know that passage has been twisted and turned and made something that it's not in the church. And so I just want to clarify it. Don't, God's not going to be fooled by you. Whatever it is you attempt to produce, if it comes out of you, it's going to be you. If it comes from God, it will be blessed. That's what he says there. But then we keep going in the passage. Verse 9. And let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season, we will reap. What would we reap? Good. Because he just told us, don't grow weary in doing good. Why? So that in the season that God calls, we will reap good things in our life. If... I love the Bible. I love that there are conditions in the Bible. That little two-letter word, if, you see it a lot in Scripture. And when you see it, you better back up and read. Okay? For in due season, we will reap good stuff. If. It'd be easy for us to just stop and go, man, as long as we sow good stuff, God's going to bless us with good stuff. The problem is what we'd want to do is we'd want to sow it once and then walk away and just continue to expect God to keep blessing us. But the passage doesn't say that. It doesn't stop at that if you sow good, then you're going to reap good. It says if you sow good, then you will reap good if we do not give up. If we don't quit, we don't stop. I I can remember times as I've walked in my own life, things that I wanted to bail out on, things that I wanted to walk away from, things that I wanted to quit. And the reality is there's this great story about an Olympic runner. And he trains his entire life to make it to the Olympics. And he gets to the Olympics, about 50,000 hours of training as a distance runner in the Olympics. I think his last name was Reddick. Derek Reddick was his name, I believe. And you can look up the YouTube story. It's a tearjerker, man. Because it walks him through this training montage and it's all this stuff. You know, it's the, it's the kind that they're playing like chariots. Of, dun, 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 dun. And you're like, oh, it's going to be amazing. And he gets to the Olympics, third lap in, he blows his Achilles. <laughs> falls to the ground. What do we do when our leg don't work and we're a runner? Well, you wait till the stretcher comes out, they carry you off the track and you let everybody finish the race and it's a forfeiture for you but not Mr. Reddick. He got up, begins dragging his leg. He was three laps into a distance race. If you've ever been to a track meet, distance races are a whole lot more than three laps. And he begins to walk and drag his leg around that track. And they said, we we can get you. He's like, "I'm I'm not done. They're like, you are done. You're in last place. There's no medal. There is no prize. There is, he said, There's, it doesn't matter. I'm not, fi- I'm not going to quit. And he finishes about the last hundred yards of the race as he come around the back corner. His dad comes out of the stands, puts his arm around him, and his father carries him across the finish line. Everybody loses their mind, and he was in last place. But they lost their mind because he didn't quit. He didn't bail on it. You say, okay, I I get it, Pastor Vince. I'm not supposed to quit. In order to really unpack it and to really embrace it, we've all got to understand that there are things and there are reasons that we quit. It's just a reality. There's reasons that we quit. The first one is this. What is one of the reasons that we quit? first one is this. We quit when we get overwhelmed. Anybody know what I'm talking about? How many of you know life is a lot? Like, it's a lot. Like, look at your person next to you and just say, you're a lot. So stay with me. How many of you married? Hands up, big and proud if you're married. Yeah. It's a lot, right? It's a lot. I mean, it's a lot. Like, I pray for my wife daily. I legitimately do. And I pray that God would bless her and that God would give her patience and long suffering. 
because I know who she's married to. And I'm a lot. I'm the emotional one in our marriage. I'm a crier. I'm a talker. Jennifer is an analyzer. She's phenomenal at arguing. And I don't, I don't, I don't mean like, uh, don't hear me wrong on that. When I say that, I mean debating. Like her thoughts get very clear. She remembers intricate details. And like, I'm pretty sure it's Sunday. But so like, she's really super blessed in this. It's one of the reasons together, I think we're a superhero. Okay, together. But it's a lot. Marriage is a lot. Especially, how many of you, how many of you been married less than five years? Hands up. <laughs> it's a lot, right? It's a lot. You're like, I can't believe you do that. You're like, I don't even like you anymore. I know, but I can't go anywhere else. I know. So I guess we're going to figure it out. How many of you have kids? <laughs> They're a lot, right? They are a lot. Even if you only have one, one's a lot. And it just keeps becoming a more a lot the more you have. How many of you are dating right now? Like you're not married, you're single. I don't want to leave you out. If you're single in the house and you're dating right now, hands up. Come on, put them out loud and proud. Put them up. Way up. I see you. I see you. Yeah. How many of you are single in the house and you're not dating right now? Hands up. All right, everybody look around. I'm trying to help you out. <laughs> I hook a brother up right here. I've got you. People come back for all three services looking at hands. <laughs> it's a lot, man. Dating in today's world. I tell people all this time when I, when I do marriage counseling, I said, here's the deal. What I know is I know that you love each other. What I also know is that you have no clue how to love each other. You love each other. The, the heart is there. The mind is there. The how-to, there's not a lesson on that, right? Nobody, nobody's like, hey, have you ever thought about how you should love someone? No, I just love them. What do you mean? I just love them. Well, what does that mean? It means I just can't live without them. No, that's codependency. I need you, I need you to know how to love them. And we walk people through this, and it's amazing what happens when people actually learn how to love one another. Some of my favorite things have been talking with people who are walking through dating right now, and they're going, oh, we don't know how to do this, because the world tells us to date a completely different way than what the Bible tells us to date. And you're like, wait, the Bible talks about dating? The Bible talks about being godly, and you can do that within dating, because it's a lot. It's not just that. I mean, you step outside the relationships, and your job is a lot. Extended family. Remember when I said I was a lot to Jennifer? I have a son-in-law that I love dearly, and I am his extended family, and I'm probably a lot to him too. Because <laughs> we're a lot, we're humans, we struggle, we have broken things in us, and so as we walk through this, we, when it gets overwhelming, sometimes the easiest thing is just throw our hands up in the air and go, I quit, I'm done, I, I can't, I can't, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. It became a common thing a few years ago. People just say, I just can't, I just can't. Well, sorry, you have to. Suck it up, quit saying stuff like that, uh, and roll into it. I hear parents say it with their kid, their kid will do something, they're like, I just can't. Well, you better, you're the only option. Because we don't get to give up on them. We don't get to bail on them. We don't get to, we don't get to cop out. We, we, we got to stay in the fight. Why? Because it's not just us. It's, it's this call that we have as believers. And I, I don't want to just hope that I make it. I'm not going to give up. I'm never finished in this fight to make sure Christ is glorified. And I got to do that in every aspect of my life. Pastor Vince, that seems like so much when I'm dealing with so much. I know relationships, kids, job. And you even get into some stuff and you're like, even in myself, like I deal with insecurities, anxiety. I got all this stuff in my mind, my own mind going on. And I don't even know what to do with the stuff in my own mind, not much less anybody else that's not only, I'm a lot independently. Sometimes it's overwhelming and I don't really know what to do. Let us not grow weary in doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we don't give up. 
2 Corinthians says this. This is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. This is going to make some of you mad. For our present troubles are small. And they won't last very long. You're like, Pastor Vince, you don't know my present troubles. I'm, I'm telling you, they're not small. It's some big stuff that I'm walking through right now. It's some big time, life-changing stuff that I'm walking. I just walked through a death. I'm just finished walking through an illness. I'm walking through a relationship that's falling apart. So don't stand there and tell me this stuff is small. Let me give you some context. The guy that wrote this verse, his name was Paul. And most likely it was written in a prison cell after a beating for a day or two. And he says, for our present troubles are small. And they won't last very long. Yet in us, they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and it'll last forever. The lessons you're going to learn in the troubles that you face here that's good stuff. It's not easy stuff, but it's good stuff. So we don't look at the trouble we can see now. This is, this, is the, this is the instruction. We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. I was talking with somebody this week, and, and they, were t- they said, Pastor Vince, what I don't need is I don't need a pat. I don't need a lamp into my feet. I need a floodlight that shows me the valley. Because if God would just give me a floodlight that shows me the valley, it'd be a lot easier for me to follow him. Follow, then I could follow. Then I could see where he wanted me to go. I'm like, no, that's a lie. You can see where he wants you to go with the lamp. But if he can't trust you with one step, why would he show you the valley? And so when we can't see it all, it leads us to the second thing. We can't control it. So we quit when we can't control it. Talked about kids. Jennifer and I have a bunch of kids, and they're awesome. They're all awesome. And please, I want you to hear me. I get this thing of being, about life being overwhelmed. I do. I truly do. I've got, I've got one kid now that's driving, one kid that starts driving in about six weeks, and the other one wants to paint rocks every night. <laughs> I also have three that are out of the house, and they love me, but I don't get to tell them what to do anymore, and it kind of ticks me off. Now, they're here, and they'll probably tell you that I I could try. I could try, because I don't get to tell them to do it. Well, this is what you should do. Parents, if you're still doing that, stop it. Stop. Your only role in adult children's life is a guardrail. You know what guardrails get? They get beat up. They keep them on the road. Yeah, but if they just do what I say. (laughs) I know. See, when we can't control it. Some of you tried to control this from the very beginning. You guys remember that time back when the the ladies be pregnant, had those headphones on their baby, like on their belly. They're just listening to classical music. I want them to be smarter. I want them to be more highly intelligent. I want to, and guess what? Your baby comes out and eats paint chips. <laughs> got that? We got some kindergarten teachers in here. There is no discrimination between which kids will eat glue and which ones won't. They'll all sample it, okay? You know why? Because it's not in your control. You don't get to control it. You're going to have to trust God with it. He says, listen, I will, light, I will give you a lamp unto your feet. And if you will trust the lamp unto your feet, you'll begin to see further out the, further, the longer you allow me to lead you, the longer your eyes adjust to the light I'm giving you, you will see further out. But some of you, you look and you go, that's not enough. And you quit. And you quit. 
And so we, we don't look at trouble we can see now. Rather, we, we fix our gaze. We fix our eyes on the things we cannot see, the plan God has for us in the future. And you say, Pastor Vince, I can't see God's plan in the future. And it drives me a little bit crazy. It absolutely is going to drive me absolutely crazy. But that's where faith comes in. I've got to trust that God is bigger than I am. I've got to trust that he has a plan that I may not see or understand. And believe me, this is hard. This is not easy. And I'm just going to, it gets harder as you get older. People are like, this is good. It should get easier. Thanks. I don't know if it is. But I know I don't get to quit. In the message, the gospel, I don't get to quit. I believe God is about to do something amazing in our community through this church. I don't know what it is. I have some ideas. I have some thoughts, man. If I, uh, next week, I'll tell you a little bit about the things I'm dreaming about. And pray, uh, I pray God shows up and does a miraculous work and they all appear. It's, that'd be awesome. But right now, I'm just kind of wrestling through some stuff going, God, I don't know. But the, two weeks ago, I was wrestling through this series. I'm like, man, I don't know if people want to, I don't know if people want to hear another story about real life church. I, I, they, may, they just may not care. This is just their church. They don't care anymore. And the enemy's just messing with me. And I got a call. I actually got a message. And that message said, Pastor Vince, I need to kneel at an altar. I need to kneel at an altar. I don't know that I've ever done it before. I don't know that, don't know that I've ever just fully committed my life to Jesus Christ, young guy. Never just completely committed my life to Jesus Christ. And I need to do that. And I responded immediately. I said, when can you be here? When can you, when can you get here? He said, about 3.30. This was about 1, 1.45 in the afternoon. So he said he could be there about 3.30. Literally, about five minutes later, I got a message. said, I'm on my way. And he walked through the door, and I met him in the foyer. I said, you okay? And he said, I, he's crying. He said, I'm just sitting in the tractor, and I was looking out over the field, and I just realized I can't do this by myself can't do this by myself. So we walked in here, he and myself and Miss Kim, and we got to kneel down right here, right on this step, this step. And he invited Jesus Christ into his heart and into his life. And he that day committed and said, Lord Jesus, I am accepting you as the Lord and Savior of my life. And that, yeah, give it up. Come on. Where are you at? Dalton, where are you, buddy? Yeah, here he is, right here. So hold on. Yeah, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. Hold on. Stay standing up. Y'all just heard an amazing story about somebody meeting Jesus Christ and accepting Jesus as their Savior. And I know what that means is it's going to change everything, not only for him, but for his sweet little family and everybody that has so, anything to do with that. But what you all don't know you got that picture back there, Doug? Can you throw it up there? Dom's going to get it for me. I want you all to see something that you don't know. Because again, sometimes we only see part of the story. Sometimes we only see this part of it where somebody said yes to Jesus and somebody finally accepted and somebody took the steps in faith just like they're supposed to do. That's, that's great. But what you don't know is this story started 20 years ago. At that little church where God called me to start Real Life Church, I baptized a little boy named Dalton. Hold on, hold on. And do you know why he called me? Because here's what the real the story is, and God has been laying this on me. Dalton, I thank you so much for trusting me, dude. You will never know because there have been moments in the last 20 years I've thought, God, if I could do anything else but this, let me. God, if there's something else you would call me to do, I'll go do it. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I know how to do this thing. I don't know if I know how to lead a church. I don't know how, I don't, God, I don't know what to do. It's a lot. And the spirit would lean into my ear and say, don't quit. You're never finished, Vince. You committed. You never finished. You never finished. And two weeks ago, this picture rolled up in my phone just as I'm praying with this kid here. And he said, if you would have quit, 
if you'd have bailed, if you'd have walked out on it, who would he have called? Now he may have a name that he'd have called, but it was all I needed. That moment and this moment are all I needed to go, I'm never giving up. I'm gonna chase down your family members and your coworkers and your schoolmates. I'm going to chase down those lost people in this community. Baxter County has 40,000 people of it, 30% of which claim some sort of religion. 70% of our county doesn't claim any. I, it doesn't matter how many people we fit in a room because the kingdom can hold them all. And that's up to you and I, Dalton. Thank you, buddy, for standing up. You guys give it up for him again. So what is it in your life? We quit. We quit when we just, we don't know what to do next. We just stop. And it's because we stop believing for God for what's next. That God could, is there a way that God could possibly have more for me? Absolutely. But have you asked him? Have you checked into him? Have God, God, what more do you have for me? And what is it? Do I need to take a, a next track class? Do I need to get in a group? Do I need to start serving? Do I, what more, God, what do you want? What do you need from my heart? Because just sitting in the seat is not enough. Just knowing that I get to go to heaven, it's not enough. There's something more that you're calling me to, God. Here I am. Send me.